Good. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. You are, you're very welcome. It's great to see uh, everyone that's come along tonight. Now, tonight, it's going to follow the same format as last week. If you weren't here last week, I'll explain the format, so don't worry about that. But let me just draw your attention, Steve. If you would put that uh, number up at the end of this evening, there'll be an opportunity for question and answer. So that's the number. It'll only be via that. It won't be questions actually from the floor as such. It'll just be uh, texted questions. So uh, you can take a note of that if you want to now, if you want to take a screenshot or a photograph of it or note it down. That'll come up at the end again. Paul, during his presentation, will use his own uh, PowerPoint. So that'll just appear now and appear at the end. So if you want to ask a question, you can take a wee note of that. Um, it's great to have Dr. Paul Coulter with us again tonight. Um, last week, Johnny gave us information on Paul, the sort of background and what have you. So I won't do all of that, but I will give you some points. Just uh, Paul has worked previously as a medical doctor in cross-cultural pastoral ministry, uh, part of the staff team of a large church. He was a lecturer in practical th theology, mentor, trainer, and manager in a Christian charity. And currently he's head of ministry operations in living leadership and a director in the Center for Christianity in Society. He also chairs Northern Ireland Voiceless, NI Voiceless. And last week's topic and tonight's topic are very, very close uh, to Paul's heart. Um, with many thousands of people, and some of you may have been there a couple of years ago, maybe two or three years ago, uh, one of the things that NI Voiceless organized was that walk to Stormont. Of course, the media reported there were 3,000 people there. In reality, there were probably 30,000 people there. And uh, I'll never forget actually going up and standing at Stormont. And I think if we're from memory, somebody blew a whistle, Paul. Isn't that how that the moments of silence started? And everyone just was quiet. And it was a, a march just in solidarity with people who have no voice uh, against abortion. But as the silence started, a baby started to cry. And it was so powerful. The, you know, a wee voice of a wee baby crying in the midst of that. And that's some of the stuff that Paul is involved in. And we're very grateful for those initiatives and for his heart for that and for people that are involved in those things. Paul's topic tonight is the certainty of death, a gospel perspective on death. It's a very relevant issue. There's currently a bill going through Parliament. Uh, and the, the line of it states, a bill to enable adults who are terminally ill to be provided with specified assistance to end their own life and for connected purposes. So it's very topical, it's very relevant, and as a church and as Christians, we want to be relevant, and we want to look at these big topics, but we want to look through them, uh, at them through the lens of a biblical perspective and also with expertise, and Paul will bring both aspects of that tonight to this topic. So we're grateful, Paul, for you and for the time that you've put in, the preparation that you've put in to bring this topic to us tonight. So as I say, Paul will give his presentation, and at the end of the night, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. So that number will appear again at the end. And if you want to uh, put a question in, we won't, I wouldn't imagine, get through all of those questions, uh, but we'll do our best to get through as many. But without anything further, I'll just hand over to Paul now and thank him. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the welcome, Glenn. Good evening. It's good to see you here. Just for clarity, I didn't poke the baby or anything to make it cry. That was unscripted, but just in case you got the wrong idea there. Um, but it is good to see you this evening. It's good to be here. It's good to be speaking about what is, I think, a vitally important topic. Um, if last week's topic is something that would affect some of us, um, this is a, an issue that surely affects every single one of us. Uh, and so although it's not an easy topic to speak about, and it's not an easy topic to speak well about, and so I will say at the outset that I hope that I will be sensitive, and if I slip in that at any point, please forgive me, but also uh, please don't, don't feel shy about pushing back, asking a question to clarify, or catching me at the end uh, and pointing that out. Um, I'm not claiming to have learnt everything that could be said on this issue, uh, by any means, but hopefully what we'll think about tonight will be useful, will be helpful. Of course, um, death is, as I'm sure you've maybe heard this saying that Benjamin Franklin said, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. I had to check that out. He did actually write that. Uh, it's not one of those urban myths that he said it. And 
Uh, death is a reality. It's a certainty. It's something that we can be sure will come. But as another writer has said, the greatest certainty in life is death. The greatest uncertainty is the time. And so we're caught with this strange reality that death is certain, but none of us quite know when that will come. Of course, it could come suddenly. It could come after a long illness, but in either situation, the timing is never certain. And those who work in medicine, or if you've been close to people and ask the doctor or others, how long has he or she got? You'll know that that's never something that can be predicted with certainty. And so this creates or contributes, I suppose, to the reality for us of death anxiety, the fear of death, anxiety about death. I am not a psychologist, but I'm led to believe that there's an increasing awareness of just how central anxiety about death, either acknowledged or unacknowledged, is to many of the issues that people face psychologically. I think there's a growing awareness of that, a growing interest in that area, and I've no doubt that that is true. Of course, the, the other strange thing about this is that even though death is certain and it is something that we know that we'll face, it's also in many ways one of perhaps the last great taboo. People don't like to talk about it. And one article a few years ago said talking about death is such a taboo that millions leave issues unresolved when they die. Again, you may well have experienced that in your family or in uh, friendships. I know that the pandemic has brought death more to the fore. It certainly has been unusual, hasn't it, to have that little element or big element earlier on in the pandemic of the number of deaths that there have been. That's become a daily feature. But whether that's made us face up to death or think more about it or cope better in our thinking about it, I suppose, remains to be seen. But it is this strange reality that we are strangely ill at ease with death. The awareness of our mortality is an uncomfortable thing for us. It's something we struggle with. There's no indication of that in any animal species on earth, but yet human beings have this awareness of death, this fear of death, and of course this sense that there is something beyond death. Now, as Glenn mentioned, there is currently a uh, bill going through the Houses of Parliament as regards assisted dying. It's the latest in quite a list of bills like that. It's currently in the House of Lords, uh, and it remains to be seen how that will play out, whether it will get to, to the Commons. It started in the Lords. But this has been going on for a number of years, and I'm sure you're well aware that some other countries have already adopted laws that legalize assisted dying, places like the Netherlands and Switzerland. And of course, uh, people have gone from the UK to some of those countries to the Dignitas Clinic, perhaps the most famous of those. This campaign for dignity in dying is uh, one of the leading groups that's working towards a legalization of assisted dying in the UK. And they say, I'm not sure of the, the basis for that, that statistic, but that 82% of the public are in support of a change in the law to allow assisted dying. Again, I'm not sure how accurate that is, but I'm sure you are well aware that many people, if you ask them, would say, well, yes, you know, why wouldn't people be able to have help? We'll come back to some of the reasons for that a little later. But more troubling for me as someone who, although I don't practice medicine, still uh, thinks of myself in some way as, a, as part of that profession. Recently, just in the last couple of weeks, the BMA, British Medical Association, which is often described as a doctor's union, it's not exactly like a union, but it serves some of those functions, but they had a, a, a decision to oppose, to drop their opposition to assisted dying. So up until that point, they had opposed it, uh, and now they have a neutral position. So it's not that they are now in favor of a change in the law, but they are now officially neutral on that uh, issue. But that's really only the last in a, quite a number of medical associations that have reached that position, a neutral position on the law, most of them historically having been opposed to assisted dying. Now, I want to try and just give a little bit of clarity to what we're talking about here, some terminology. So bear with me as I do that. 
we're talking here about ending innocent lives, an action that ends the life of an innocent person. And I put the word innocent in there as shorthand for acknowledging that there is another debate around issues like capital punishment, war, uh, and self-defense, of course. Those are, are, are situations that we could discuss or talk about, but let's park those for a moment and think specifically here about innocent lives, people who are not obviously guilty of something that would be classed as deserving death. We could talk about murder. Of course, there's a legal definition of murder, but murder widely would be accepted as where someone kills another person. But then when we talk about a term like euthanasia, we need to add to that that this is one person killing another person or ending the life of another person in order to relieve suffering. So that's what sets euthanasia apart from murder by definition. Whether that is truly distinct morally is another question. But again, within this category of euthanasia, we could talk about involuntary euthanasia, where one person takes an action to end another person's life without that person's consent, perhaps against their wishes or without asking them for about, about it. We could talk about non-voluntary euthanasia. So this is where a person cannot give their consent. Perhaps they are um, in a coma, perhaps they have advanced dementia, perhaps they don't have the ability to make a reasoned decision. And then, of course, we could talk about voluntary euthanasia, where the person consents or requests that someone does this for them. And then there's another phrase, of course, another word, suicide. And suicide, as I'm sure you're aware, means a person ending his or her, her own life. But we need to distinguish within that between assisted suicide, where someone else helps you to end your own life. They provide the, the drug that will kill you, or they set up the system and let you press the button that will give you a lethal injection, or they, they help you to plan it or to get what you need to do it. That's what assisted suicide would be. And unassisted suicide, where a person takes their own life without any assistance from another person. So I hope I've given some clarity to some of these terms. You, you've probably heard of euthanasia and maybe wondering, how is that different? When we're talking about assisted dying, which is the bill currently in Parliament, often people mean assisted suicide. Sometimes they mean beyond that, voluntary euthanasia. But at the moment, it's not really being proposed, the idea of non-voluntary or involuntary euthanasia but we're in this territory of assisted suicide and voluntary euthanasia. Now, the UK law, as things currently stand, I'm sure you probably could draw the line. That's where the line in UK law currently is, that assisted suicide is not legal. It is criminal in the UK. But that is only the case since 1961. Prior to 1961, in UK law, unassisted suicide was also a criminal offence. Now, that probably sounds a little strange to you. How could you criminalise somebody who has killed themselves? Aren't they dead already anyway? How could you then find them guilty of a crime? And of course, you may well be saying, well, isn't that terribly uh, lacking in compassion to the family of that person? Because so many people who take their own life are not in a clear state of mind. They're in a very dark or low place, and it seems wrong to heap on to what the family are already experiencing, this guilt of the idea that they committed a crime in their last moment. But of course, if we try and understand why was it that suicide was treated as criminal before 1961, it was because there was a view that it was wrong to take one's own life, just as it would it is self-murder, so there was a moral basis for that, and there was also a deterrent basis, if you like, to try and make it clear to people that we are clear as a society that this is not what we approve of. I suppose society has very few ways to indicate that without making something criminal or, or giving an incentive against it. 
So, so there was a deterrent element or supposed to be within that. But the law changed in 1961, and I think many of us, I think I would agree that that was a compassionate change that was meant to uh, remove some of that pressure on, on families. There is in the UK, at least in Britain, a clear set of guidelines, or reasonably clear, I think, lawyers might uh, take issue with that definition. But in 2010, the Crown Prosecution Service in uh, Britain put together some guidelines because assisted suicide is, is criminal and because there was a concern that, well, what happens if somebody uh, who loves their wife or their husband, for example, who has journeyed with them through a terrible illness, if in a moment of, of compassion they assist the person, it would seem wrong that that person would then be taken to court and prosecuted, maybe found guilty, potentially even put in prison. And so the Crown Prosecution Service put in place a set of guidelines for prosecutors to decide whether they should bring a prosecution. And those include things like looking at the nature of the relationship, the age of the person who has died, whether they had a settled wish, whether they needed assistance. In other words, if there is, it was a clearly loving relationship, if there's no evidence of another motivation other than compassion and love, if the person was an adult, if they had clearly expressed their wishes, it is unlikely that a prosecution would be brought. In other words, people are not put into prison for that kind of action. But, but the concern there, you can see it in some of those criteria, can't you, is that if we decriminalized assisted suicide, well, how would we protect against children, for example, who being, being helped to kill themselves? How would we protect against influence or pressure being put on someone because someone thinks they will gain from the death of that person, maybe an inheritance? How could we avoid the risk that, that murder could be dressed up or pretended to be assisted suicide? Now, thinking about suicide, I, I do want to say this, and these are, are statements from the World Health Organization. 703,000 people every year end their lives, their own lives. And they rightly say that every suicide is a tragedy. I don't know if you have experienced that. I have in my family um, an uncle who took his own life, and I know the effect that that had on my grandparents, on his siblings, on his children. It is a great tragedy when someone takes their own life. And they go beyond that and they say it is also a serious public health problem. And we recognize that, don't we? We're very aware that there are campaigns to try and reduce suicide, to give people hope in life. But it seems to me that there's a very strange contradiction between that, between recognizing that a suicide is a tragedy, that it's a serious public health problem, and then saying, but in some circumstances, suicide is a good or maybe even a noble thing. We need to work that through, don't we? In what circumstances is it? And how, as a society, could we say to people, suicide is bad, don't do it, and at the same time endorse suicide for other people. There are, of course, two big arguments in favor of assisted dying. And these come up in uh, chats about it. These are comments that were posted in a, in a news article that was about one gentleman a number of years ago who was seeking to be able to end his own life. And one person said, it's really time we had some common sense and sympathy for these people. If the poor man wants to die, who are we to deny him that? That's an argument from compassion for those who are suffering. How could we expect somebody to keep living in that kind of suffering, that kind of life? That poor man, sympathy. And that, of course, ought to move us, oughtn't it? I mean, it would be we would be hard-hearted if we weren't moved by the suffering of people in terminal illness or with chronic pain or with debilitating disabilities. But it raises some questions, doesn't it? Whose suffering are we talking about? 
Because often, and, and I say this with some experience, I worked for a short time in the Northern Ireland Hospice and for a bit longer in medicine, but also from what I've read and observed that often there is this issue and the people that I've talked to pastorally, that, that the suffering often is, is not only, of course, it's never only in the individual who is suffering, but there is also the suffering of their relatives, of those who are close to that person. And there are times, actually, where, where it is the suffering of the relative that isn't being handled well. In other words, they're not getting the support that they need. And so they're looking on and they think he must be, she must be feeling that way. Actually, that might be wrong. There may be no evidence for that. For example, towards the end of life, there can be a rattle in the throat, and often family members are distressed and say that must be distressing for him or for her, but there isn't necessarily any evidence that that's the case. In other words, what I'm, what I'm saying here is that there is a pressure around this issue, and there's a pressure for the person who is dying that they start to feel that they are a burden to those who are around them. And, and so, Compassion is, yes, a good thing, but sometimes it can be misguided. When we think, oh yes, I would support that, I would want that if I were in that position, we don't really know what it feels like to be in that position. And then secondly, what degree or kind of suffering are we talking about? Now the bill that's coming for uh, coming through the Houses of Parliament at the moment is to do with terminal illness. But how do we define that? How long do we have to predict that the person will live? You see, the difficulty with that is that all of us are born with a terminal condition, if I can put it that way. None of us will live forever in these bodies. And once you start to say that length of life or that predicted length of life is okay, who decides that? Who draws the line in that place? And what kind of suffering? Physical suffering, yes, but what about emotional suffering? Would we say if somebody has no physical illness but they are chronically depressed, that that would be the grounds if they say, I want to end my life? Why would we make that distinction? You see that it's not so simple to define. And a third issue and a third point is this, that there is an alternative. Now, at this point, I don't want to sound critical of the medical profession at all. I hope I don't. I know some of you are here. But those who work in healthcare know very well that the care that is available to people at the end of life is not always as good as it should or could be. In other words, we have an issue as a society with the fact that many people still, at the end of life, don't get as good care as they could if they were in a different place or a different person or if the resources were available for them. That's a simple reality. And there are these alternatives of palliative care, caring for a person, looking after their symptoms, giving them all of the emotional support that they, they could have. And the evidence is very, very clear that when people have that in place, they are much less likely to ask for assistance to end their life. So there's a challenge for us as a society to say, where are we going to put the emphasis? We can change the law and say, well, if you want to end your life, we'll allow that or we'll support you or help you. But the harder path for society is to say, how are we going to care for one another? How are we going to make sure that the resources are there, that no one finds themselves in the place where they find that they don't want to or can't imagine continuing? Advanced care planning is also part of that alternative, and I'll come back to that. But let me just show you this graph. This is another medical association, the Royal College of Physicians, which did a poll of its members in 2019 about whether they should change to a neutral position or start, uh, change, uh, stop opposing the law, the, the law is a, a change to the law. You notice that Overall, there were 43% of their members said we shouldn't support a change in the law. We should keep opposing it. There was a much smaller percentage. Uh, it was, uh, well, 30, not a much smaller, but 31.6% of those who were polled said we should support a change in the law. 25% said we should have a neutral position. 
And so on the basis that there wasn't a clear majority, the Royal College of Physicians adopted a neutral position, which was the position that had the smallest percentage support. But that's what happens, you go down, down the middle. But notice this graph. These are the results from different specialties. And the specialty that stands out is palliative medicine, the specialists in caring for people when they are terminally ill and close to death. And in that specialty, 80% of those who were polled were opposed to a change in the position. They, in other words, they oppose the law changing. They want to keep the law the way it is. 5% said, yes, it should change. And the rest said, let's stay neutral. In other words, those who are closest, those doctors who are closest to people in death, who are, I would suggest, the experts on this subject, and I would want to go as far as to say that the medical profession should do what it expects us to do and listen to the experts, they're the ones who are least likely to support a change of the law because they know the care that is possible. They know what happens when that care is good. And maybe that might give some of us a little bit of assurance as well to know that there is the possibility of good care. But the other argument that's often put forward for assisted dying goes something like this, another quote um, on that website. If this guy is of sound mind, he has got to have the last say on his life or death. In other words, this is the, the right to choose argument, the argument from autonomy that I as an individual should choose. And it's logical, isn't it? If we've lived our whole lives with the idea of autonomy, that I can choose absolutely everything that I like, and we live in a society of hyper choice, you know, we want to be able to choose from thousands of products online, hundreds of products on the supermarket shelf, we want to choose the timing for everything, then of course when it comes to death, we're going to think along those lines as well. Now that also raises some questions. Whose choice is it? How do you make sure that the patient is the one who is making the choice? How do you ever be sure that a decision is truly free of influence? You see, once the possibility is there that it's an option for you to choose to have help to end your life, that opens up a world of possibility that wasn't there before. And you start to think about that and you start to think, well, I'm a burden. I'm no use to anyone. I'm a burden to everyone. They could get on with their lives if I wasn't here. Now, I think that thinking is, is misguided, but that's how the thinking goes. And so at what point is that no longer a free decision? At what point is a decision a settled decision? In other words, we know that the person won't change their mind. Lots of problems from a practical point of view with knowing how would you ever safeguard against someone being pushed, pressurized. You can say that you can put safeguards in place, but I fail to see how those can ever guarantee that. But of course, the bigger question is do we actually have that right? Are there limits to our autonomy? And this is where I need to speak from a Christian perspective. Last week, I talked about the roots of human dignity. I said that there are three in the Christian message, the past, the present, the future, the past. We were created, every single one of us, in the image of God. That gives us dignity. We are loved by God, that gives us dignity, and we have the potential of living eternally with God, that gives us dignity. Three roots to human dignity, three legs of the stool. And the important thing to say at this point is that none of those roots are, are affected or changed by disability or disease or illness or suffering. These things are, are because of what we are God's past in creating us and because of the fact that God loves us and because of the fact that there is hope beyond this life. But last week I worked through this little outline of the gospel. Let me just remind you of that or tell you it if you weren't here. And I'm going to use that as a framework for thinking about a Christian view, a gospel view on death. God rules, first of all. God created us. The God who created us rules over the universe. 
That's a starting point of the story. In the beginning, God, the Bible says, right at the very beginning. But we rebelled. We turned away from God in sin. But God rescues. He put in plan or in place a plan of salvation. He sent his son to save us from our sins. We need to respond to acknowledge our sin, to repent and turn away from it and to trust in God. And if we do that, God restores. In other words, the end of the story is not my response. It's the fact that God then begins to transform me by the work of the Holy Spirit and gives me hope for the future beyond this life. So what does all of that mean when it comes to the the subject of death? Well, at the very beginning of the Bible, death is not in the picture. Human death is not there. God created human beings to live, to live with Him. He provided for them a good world, a world full of everything that they needed, and He sustained their life. There was one tree, according to Genesis, Uh, 2, Genesis 1 and 2, that it says God said you're not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Every other tree you can eat from, including the other tree that is named the tree of life. They had access to it. They could keep on living because God provided what they needed to keep on living. So where did death come into the equation? Well, death is the result of of our pursuit of autonomy. Autonomy, if it means my right always to choose for myself, that comes incredibly close to the definition of what sin is. I don't want to acknowledge God's rule anymore. I want to choose for myself every detail of my life, including my death. And the result of our pursuit of that was suffering and death. These things came as a result of sin. So why did God bring death into human experience? Well, what does it say in Genesis 3? After Adam and Eve had eaten from the tree that they were commanded not to eat, it says, the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. God put Adam and Eve out of the garden, away from the tree of life, so that they would not and could not continue to live forever alienated from him. Now, that was a judgment, yes. Often we might think of of death coming as a judgment, but it is also a great mercy. Please hear me carefully. I'm not saying that death suddenly becomes a good thing. But it is a good thing that we die. Because if we don't die, we will continue forever. If, if God allowed us to keep on living, if he sustained this life in this body forever, it would mean that you and I have to live with all of the frailties of this body forever, through endless pandemics. We'd have to live with all of the inner turmoil that I'm sure goes on in your mind and heart as well, the confusion and the struggle and the temptations. In other words, death is God's way of calling time on our life alienated from him, to call us back to accountability to him. It's often the awareness of mortality that makes people think about their need of God, isn't it? One of the reasons that I think people are asking the questions about God less or later, at least, in the Western world is because we've created a world where we put it off and we don't think about death. But awareness of mortality can be good if it makes us think about ultimate reality and ultimate truth. And and it's not simply death is God's way of holding us to account. It is through death And then future resurrection, the Bible tells us, that we come to a life that is different from this one, where we are no longer subject to disease and to death. But I'm running ahead in the story. I'll come to that. The Bible also says this. It's appointed to people once to die, and after that, the judgment. Death is the great reminder that actually I can't keep living my way forever indefinitely. There is an accountability to God. 
And within that, just to be absolutely clear, the, the Scriptures are clear on this, not only in the Ten Commandments that I've quoted here, but throughout the Scriptures in many places, that it is a sin to kill another human individual or an innocent human individual. You shall not murder. Nobody has the right to take the life of another person according to God's law. And further than that, suicide, I think it is right to understand suicide as self-killing in biblical terms, as self-murder. In other words, we do not have the right given to us by God to take our own life. Now, notice I've said if we're in our own right mind, and I want to acknowledge that clearly, many people when they take their own life, are not in their right mind, not thinking clearly, not understanding that decision. But the point is that, biblically speaking, our bodies and our lives are not our own to do with as we will. We are accountable to God. This is why Christians have such a different view on so many issues because actually this body of mine, as long as it's alive, is not mine to do with as I will, and death is not mine to bring upon myself. But I will say, and we'll maybe come back to this in a question, if you have a question about that, that suicide is not, as some have thought about it, an unforgivable sin. There is that idea that I'm sure you've come across somewhere that, you know, if you commit suicide, then you can't go to heaven. That is simply not biblical. There is nothing, as Romans 8, Romans 8 puts it, that can separate us, those that God loves, his own children from his love, including death itself. Killing innocent human beings, including ourselves, is a sin. But God rescues, and how did God rescue? He, he defeated death through death and resurrection. This is a wonderful passage from Hebrews chapter 2. It says, God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood. So the Son of God, that is Jesus, became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. That fear of dying that is part of our experience. Jesus has set us free, not just from the fear of dying, but actually from death itself. He entered into death in our place, on our behalf, as a result of our sins to pay the price. And in doing so, he defeated death itself. And he rose from the dead. And when he was on this earth, he said to Martha, whose brother had recently died, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Notice what Jesus is saying. He says, if you die, you will live again. There is resurrection hope because Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus rose. We who believe in him will rise. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. There is no more death after that. It's not that you rise again to die again, which is what happened to Martha's brother, but this resurrection is permanent to eternal life. And we have to respond to this message. We have to repent, to believe, and to obey. Christians are the living dead. I hope I'm not infringing any copyrights on that. I've never seen, I think it's a TV series. I'm not even sure. But we Christians are the living dead. Why do I say that? Because even baptism, that fundamental Christian action of, of, of our faith, is a declaration that there, the old me is dead already. <laughs> I know I'm going to die physically one day, but actually the old me, the me that I would be without God, the me that I was before I turned from sin and trusted in Jesus is dead, and I am now going to live a new life as I look forward to the resurrection of my body. And so the Apostle Paul could say in a verse that has meant a lot to me over the years, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. In other words, Death takes on a new perspective because if I die, I go to be with him. And so as I live, I'm going to live for him. 
We can't think as Christians about death without also thinking about the purpose of life. And God restores. Because the hope that is in store is of a world with no more death, eternal hope and present help. What makes for a good death? The word euthanasia actually from the Greek means a good death. And we ought to think about what makes for a good death. Well, the Apostle Paul, who I've just quoted, towards the end of his life said this, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The time has come for my departure from my death. I'm ready to die. He was aware that his death, as far as he knew, was coming soon. And he says this, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Two things, I think, from Paul's example make for a good death. A certain hope, and I'll come back to that in my last slide. But a certain hope, Paul has a certain hope. He knows where he's going. He knows he will face his judge. And he knows that because he has held on to faith in the Lord Jesus, he's kept the faith, he's trusted in Jesus, that he will receive the crown of righteousness. But also, he had no unfinished business. And the real challenge of death, isn't it, is to say, what is the business that I should be about? Paul was clear about the purpose that he lived for. He lived his life for that. None of us will reach our, our deathbed and be able to say, I never messed up, I lived it perfectly. But we have the option now to say, I will live as far as I am able. And by God's grace, I'm going to live for what matters now, from now on. Also, and Paul doesn't say this, but I would say this in, based on experience, maintaining good and healthy relationships. When I worked in the hospice, often the greatest thing that we could do for people was not the drugs that we could give for their physical pain or their nausea. It was helping them to restore relationships with family members, or at least to reach a point where they could, could be at peace, not fighting. That's a huge part of dying well. And thirdly, planning ahead and knowing when to accept death. And I said earlier that palliative care and advanced planning is part of what we can do better when it comes to death. And this is what I would want to say to all of us that it is good to have the conversations. <clears throat> no unfinished business, not ending because of the taboo that the slide said earlier without having resolved things. There is the option of refusing treatment. Modern medicine has been a wonderful gift to us. I really believe that. It's been such a wonderful gift, especially in prolonging life. Not always in improving the quality of life, especially at the end of life. Okay, that's, that's where it has not been so strong. So it has prolonged life, and it's given many of us longer years of good health. But doctors, like everybody else, and we saw it in some of the statistics, they're influenced by the same ways of thinking as everybody else. And they struggle to talk about death often, just as you or I may, especially if they're not in a specialty that is facing death, like palliative care. But we should and can have those conversations about what treatment would we like to have. Saying no to further treatment, even declining nutrition. I know people often struggle with that, but when someone is unable to eat or has no appetite any longer because their body is shutting down, rather than thinking we've got to keep feeding them, recognizing this is part of the process of approaching death, or deciding not to have an attempt at CPR, resuscitation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That's often, again, where the medical dramas mislead us because there, you know, someone comes in and shocks the person and, whoa, they're, they're back. That's often not the reality, especially in a hospital setting and certainly where someone is progressively moving towards death. Often there, all that happens is the person may be brought back for a short bit of extra time, but often actually they die in that context, and it's not very dignified. We should think about those things, and, and it is legitimate, I want to say that, I believe that firmly as a Christian, biblically speaking, to refuse 
treatment if either the treatment is useless, in other words, it's not going to benefit your health, or if you decide that the burden, the side effects of that treatment are so that you don't want to experience that, the quality of life. And I think that may help us often with this challenge because sometimes people are dying in a way that is more undignified because they've been treated too long, pushed too far, kept alive in a way that maybe wasn't in their best interest. Because as Christians, if we take that course, we're not choosing death. What we are choosing is life with better quality and focus. Again, there may be questions about that, but I want to finish with the hope that there is this hope, this future hope. 1 Corinthians 15 is a chapter that talks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and then it says this, we will not all sleep. Sleep is a way of describing death that Christians use, the Bible uses. Maybe we don't use it enough because as Paul, the apostle who wrote this, is writing about it, it's, you know, we're going to be raised again, brought back to life, so it's temporary, like falling asleep but we won't all sleep. There you go. Death is not certain (laughs) because when Jesus comes again, there will be people who are alive on earth and trusting in him. Not everyone will go through death, but we will all, he says, be changed. Whether we've died or whether we are still alive, when Jesus comes, we will be transformed. And then the saying that is written will come true. And notice this because you may have heard it and I have said it at gravesides. Death is where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? And you maybe like I have stood there and said, well, here it is. It's obvious. But Paul doesn't say that that is what is true now. Death is a reality and a painful one now, but the day is coming when death itself will be no more. And then we can declare this truth. And when we declare it now at a graveside, we're doing it prophetically saying this is what will be when Christ returns. For now, death is painful, it's difficult, it's challenging. But the day is coming when there will be no more sting. It's gone. Because God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more, no more mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. I hope that's given you some insights into a gospel view on death, but I'm sure there'll be some questions. Glenn, come and join me. Great. Paul, first of all, I'd just like to thank you, uh, not only for your expertise and your knowledge, but your sensitivity uh, in this topic. And actually, that's a a reflection of the first uh, question, because these are topical issues, but they're very sensitive, very personal issues to people as well. So here's a question. Uh, My grandmother was a devout Christian, but she had terminal cancer. She asked the doctor to give her something to end her life and suffering, which he did. This was in the 1940s. Was she wrong in doing that? Surely, if you're terminally ill, you have the right to die with dignity. Uh, thanks, Glenn. I mean, I, I, I think th- that we should make every effort to make death dignified. So I would start at the end of that statement. Yes, I think, uh, I think it's right that the care should be around people that allows them. Sorry, this is maybe playing up, but that, that allows them to die as dignified a death as is, as is possible. Um, But the idea that that involves hastening, actively choosing to bring that death about more quickly, I think is misguided. Um, I don't think that's what brings dignity. I think it's making sure that the person is well cared for, making sure there's no unfinished business, um, making sure they're ready to meet their God, most importantly, and that they have good care for their symptoms. But I think I I don't know clearly, and I suspect the person who asked the question may not know exactly the details if this was in the 1940s. I know that people think that doctors often do this, that they give a, a, you know, a dose of a drug that's going to kill that person to sort of ease them out of their suffering. In my experience, that's not the case. Even in the hospice where, where I worked, that was not what happened. What does sometimes happen is that people are given a drug which is to relieve their suffering, their pain, for example, an opioid, a morphine or a variant of morphine. Um, and we know that an overdose of morphine can kill 
Um, but, but it's not that doctors and nurses are coming in and giving this huge dose. They're often giving quite a large dose because the nature of those drugs is that if you're, the more intense your pain is, the bigger dose your body can tolerate. Okay? So often those doses are gradually increased over time to keep on top of the pain. Um, and it is possible that in some situations that, that drug either speeds up death or may even cause death. But it's not that doctors and nurses are, are just saying, okay, let's now give the big dose. Um, what they're doing is taking an action that is intended to relieve suffering, but has the unintended consequence of causing death. And there's a moral principle, it's called double effect. In other words, the, the action is not being taken to end the life. That's a, a side effect that was unintended. And that's in a different moral category, category I believe. So, so I would say that partly to give reassurance. It's not my experience, and I hope I'm, I'm not abnormal in that, that doctors are willy-nilly um, doing this. But actually what they're doing is with people who are at the very end of life, trying to give them the best care that they can. Um, and and it's, it's one of those possibilities that in some cases that drug might hasten death but that's only in those very last days when death is imminent in any case. So was this lady wrong? I suppose was part of the question if, if she asked for that. I, I don't know that it's wrong to ask for that. I think when someone is in a very a place of real suffering, they will often ask for things or in a moment they will ask for that. It may not even be their settled uh, way of thinking. Um, was it wrong for someone to give it to her? Well, I think if they gave it with the intention of causing death, yes. But if they were giving it to relieve suffering and the unintended consequence was death, then, then no. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. you. You described in your presentation suicide as a sin. Yeah. Uh, so someone has said, I know some people have thought that means someone who commits suicide won't go to heaven. I know you touched on this. Mm -hmm. uh, but what would you say to that? Yeah, th thanks, Glenn. I'm quite glad to, to clarify that because um, th the idea that, that a person who commits suicide, again, I'm sure many of us have, have, have come across that idea that that person cannot go to heaven is based um, on a wrong, a non-biblical understanding of salvation. Um, it's based on an idea of salvation that, that thinks that there is a, what is called a state of grace and that to have a, a chance of going to heaven, you need to die in a state of grace. And this is part of certainly medieval and I think even contemporary Roman Catholic teaching. It may not be what all Roman Catholic people believe, but um, the idea is that, that, that that's why the last rites are so important for, uh, in Roman Catholic practice, because you want to die in a state of grace. And how do you get into a state of grace? You have to confess your sins to the priest who gives you absolution. You have to take um, the sacrament, as they'll call it, the Lord's um, Supper, the bread, uh, at least from that, um, and, and then, then you have a chance of dying in a state of grace, and of course, many would believe then going to purgatory and paying off the rest of your sins. That idea is just not found in Scripture. What Scripture teaches us is that the person who has placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is saved. They are in Him, they belong to Him, they become a child of God. Um, and, and that's not something that can be be lost or thrown away just through one action. Uh, and the action of, of suicide may be a sin. I do believe that it is. But, but no more than any sin would separate a believer, a Christian from the love of God does that sin. Okay? So, so this idea that you can, you can fall from that state of grace. And of course, the problem in the other way of thinking is that if you commit suicide as your last act, you can't confess that sin. You can't then um, receive the sacrament, and so on. Um, but that idea just isn't found in the Bible anywhere. So I would want to reassure people. Um, my, my uncle, who took his own life, was, was a believer. Um, and, and I have no uh, doubts that based on the Word of God, he is with his Savior, he's with his Lord. Um, what led to the circumstances of him taking his own life was, was tragic for everyone. He was not in a good place. I'm not sure what he understood or thought in those moments. But I do believe that the Lord Jesus, who had held him up to that point, kept holding him. Salvation is not how strong our hold is on God, but how strong his hold is on us. So I think especially when someone's in a place where they actually believe that they're doing something good for other people, which is the great tragedy when someone feels suicidal, they may actually think this is actually good for people. It's not. Please hear me on that. It never is.
but um, but they think that, and, and so they're not acting in a way that is selfish, as we some people might un, unfairly think. Yeah, thank you. That's very very encouraging, and very uh, sure. for, for people in that yeah. position as well. Uh, this question is: God has numbered all of our days. So last week you quoted from Psalm 139. Mm -hmm. You know, we created our mother's womb. Before we lived the day, you knew all about them. So God has numbered all of our days and knows the exact time when we when we die. So why is suicide much worse than medicine that will prolong lives? Yeah. Um, so behind that question, the idea that God has numbered our days, I, I would agree and I do believe absolutely that God knows how long we will live, that he knows the day of our death. But this is... Um, uh, a mystery in some way that within that we clearly have freedom to make choices um, uh, and that isn't in any way in contradiction to the fact that God knows uh, and that God has a purpose and a plan so so I think it would be wrong to say that I couldn't take an action that would end my life before God wanted it to end okay because if you said God's numbered our days and somebody commits suicide well obviously God planned that he didn't God doesn't plan sin he doesn't plan wrong actions. He doesn't um, plan death in those circumstances. The person has made those choices in the same way that we might make lifestyle choices that will cause us to die sooner than we would have otherwise, carrying too much weight or, or smoking, all of these things. So we make our own choices and they have consequences and God allows that to happen. That doesn't mean God doesn't know. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan uh, for us. And it, it also doesn't mean that God um, stops loving us if we make those wrong choices. He, you know, that we can come back on track with his plan, even where we've veered off. Um, but I think the question, the other part of the question about is it wrong to take medicine that prolongs life? Um, I think we should be incredibly thankful for the gift of modern medicine. It is a wonder uh, how much good medicine can do for us. But I think what I was saying towards the end of the presentation is that there is a time when it is right and legitimate to say, actually, my time has come. It's okay to reach that place. That's not necessarily a bad thing. A person who's thinking that way is not necessarily depressed. They could be very clear in their thinking. They know that they have run the course, like the Apostle Paul said. They've done the work that they can see that they have to do. Now, that's not saying we seek death or we embrace it. We do something to make it happen quicker. But that when you're reaching the point when your body is wearing out, which is really what happens with aging, your body wears out and things start to go wrong, systems start to fail, uh, and there comes a point when it is a right and a healthy thing to say actually enough is enough. Now, that's not to say if you reach that point, just stop all your medication. That could be very unpleasant and very unhelpful. But that is a time when you could then talk to your doctor about what should we do. You can talk to your family uh, and say, explain that to them. Um, because the more we can talk about those things, the better that will be and, and the better we can begin to manage that. I think those conversations don't happen early enough in most cases. And sadly, because our medical system is often poorly joined up, and that's probably an understatement, um, there often is no one who actually takes charge of that from a medical point of view. So sometimes we have to initiate it. it. It's hard for a doctor to do that if they're a specialist who's only treating one aspect of your health. It's quite hard for them then to ask a big question about life and death. Um, it, it's also hard if they don't know you. Uh, and of course, it's always wonderful if you have a doctor, a family doctor who really does know you, but we don't always have that. So these things are hard for various reasons. But I think we, as, as people who are thinking about this issue, should be able to have those conversations as early as possible. Start to think, what, what would I want? What choices would I want? That can also be incredibly helpful for our family, that rather than them having to make the choices or, or guess what we would have wanted if we're no longer able to communicate with them, then we, we've explained that and they know this is actually what he or she wanted. Um, so. That's a long answer, um, but I think we shouldn't think of God ordaining our lives as meaning we can't die before God has said, so I can go out and speed as long as I, you know, whatever. That would just be wrong. It would be wrong to take an action to hasten death. But it is right and appropriate that we think how much treatment, when, when is the time to say no, when's the time to accept death. And um, that is a good and, a, and can be a positive thing. Yeah. So. On that point, and you mentioned about hospice and yes. that end of life care and your experience of that. 
So someone has said they've heard that the modern hospice movement was started by Christians. Is that true? And if so, why did they bring yeah. that about? It was certainly, the, I mean, the hospice movement, generally the founder of that's regarded as Dame Cicely Saunders, who was quite a, a remarkable woman. Um, she certainly was motivated by, um, by Christian faith, by Christian principles. I'm, I'm not um, certain of exactly what she believed or, or what that looked like in her life, but that was certainly part of her motivation. She was a nurse and then went on and trained to be a doctor. Um, uh, so quite really remarkable and did a wonderful job of thinking about what she called total pain. Um, so, so looking at pain, not just as physical, but as emotional, uh, and of course within that, the understanding that there can be a spiritual dimension to that. So that's what we can call holistic care, and I think th there's still a distance to go for that to get more into the mindset of the whole of healthcare, but it's the right way to think, it's the right way to approach life. But that's the modern hospice movement. I mean, there is a much older and longer legacy of, of both medical care and end-of-life care that has very clear uh, Christian roots. Uh, you know, if you look at the big hospitals in London that you might hear about in the news, the big, you know, specialist centers, St. Thomas's, St. Bartholomew's, the reason they're called saint somethings is because they grew out of monasteries or uh, religious institutions that were providing care for the sick. Um, so healthcare is one of those benefits. Last week I talked about how Christianity gave us um, the idea of human rights, but actually Christianity also gave us that idea of universal health care. Um, we just forget that, we don't realize because we handed it over to the state um, and the state has, has managed that for us, but it was really the church that gave us that, gave us education as well, lots of those things that we should be thankful for. Um, and I think that's because Christians Christians have, have been able to have a view of death. When we embrace the, the gospel story of death, uh, and, and I have to confess, by the way, I don't sit here as somebody who finds that easy. <laughs> I can struggle with that too. I've had my own times of the fear of death. But when we embrace that, it gives us a perspective on death where we realize that death is an enemy. I've seen this in, in funerals. I've conducted not many funerals, but a few in my time, and I've I've seen families who are Christians and families who aren't. And in some of those cases, most of those cases in my limited experience, the, the, the Christian families actually grieved more intensely and more honestly than those non-Christian families. In other words, they, weren't, they, they were able to, to name death as what it was. They were able to acknowledge that the person was dead, to, to grieve deeply, to be deeply hurt and struggle because I don't have, as a, as a Christian, I'm, I don't have to accept the idea that I suppose if I believed in that we all came here through evolution, that death's just the way it is. I mean, come on, get over it. Don't be bothered by it. That, that doesn't work when it's someone you love. Um, but Christians can say, no, this isn't right. This isn't natural and it isn't fair. It's not the way it should be because it's not the way God created it to be. So I think Christianity makes sense of that experience and allows us to grieve intensely, but not without hope. And that's the wonderful thing, that you're, you're able to acknowledge death and to express the intensity of that, but also to know that there is hope of resurrection, that this is not the end, that this is, this is, is the end of this life, but this person isn't here anymore, but they haven't ceased to exist. Uh, and there is that hope of resurrection. And that is a, I think that gives Christians this unique perspective. And I think that also motivates Christians to be able to be close to people who are dying and care for them um, in a way maybe that is harder for, for people who don't have that faith. Uh, but that's been true from the very beginning. In the early Roman Empire, there, was, uh, there were plagues that swept the cities, pandemics, if you like. Um, and, and what you did, if you were a poor person, you battened down the hatches and stay, tried to stay away from anybody who had the disease in case you got it. If you were rich, you got out of town to your villa in the countryside and came back whenever the, the, the thing had died down. But the Christians, and this is clearly documented in history, they, they had a different approach. They cared for their neighbors and they cared for each other because they weren't ultimately afraid of death. They realized that death is not the ultimate ill that there are worse things than death. <laughs> I mean, it would be a worse thing to miss the point of life than to die. And so they cared for other people. And one of the reasons that Christianity grew statistically was because more Christians survived 
and some of those who, who they cared for came to Christian faith as well. Um, that was part of the growth of the church, and that's always been the way, and it should be the way today as well, that Christians are at the forefront of caring for others. That, that last, yeah. this is the last question. Other people sure. have sent questions and apologies. Well, I mean, I, because I'm happy to take a few more, but you need to well, close off time. <laughs> Glenn, don't worry. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. y- your last comments on uh, Christianity, you know, the influence of Christianity in healthcare, the yes. influence of Christianity in education, uh, and bringing that hope. What about someone who says simply, that's naive. Christians, you're just naive. You're naive, yeah. and it's just a crutch that you're hoping to lean on to give you yeah. some sort of hope. What would be your response to that? Yeah, I mean, this, this again, is a claim that's been made for quite a long time, that Christianity is a, is a crutch um, that you lean on. Um, uh, the counter I mean, the other argument that goes along the same lines was what Karl Marx said, that religion, Christianity, specifically in Russia, that he was looking at in Germany, where he was based, is, and London, even, where he came to, is um, uh, that, that uh, it's the opioid of the masses. It just kind of numbs the pain as we go through life. Um, uh, there's lots that I could say to that. Get me back another night, Glenn, and we could actually <laughs> talk about that subject because I, I have done. Um, but I, I, I think that is a misunderstanding of the nature of Christian faith. Um, Christian faith does bring great consolation to people. But it does it, and I said this earlier, that Christians are the walking dead. It does it through a process that is painful. (laughs) C.S. Lewis wrote about this. He described himself as the most reluctant convert in Christendom. In other words, he didn't really want to acknowledge that God was true, but he found he had no option to do it. He he was an atheist before, the guy who wrote the Narnia books. Um, And uh, he, he, he had to acknowledge that. And he said that actually we come to that consolation through a process, not quoting him exactly, but it's like death. You know, we actually have to own up to the fact that I am not autonomous, that I'm not my own Lord, I'm not my own, you know, that's not comfortable for anyone. It's not always comfortable for me, and I've been a Christian for a long time. Um, There's a large part of me that wants to pull away from that, against that, that frankly wants to be selfish and live the life I want to live. So so don't get the the misunderstanding that Christianity is just all comfortable and nice. I mean, many, many Christians throughout history have died because of their belief in this. That wasn't comfortable in this life. Didn't bring them any benefit. Following a savior who was poor and who died because he was put to death by the authorities and the religious leaders, that's not comfortable if we really follow him. It's not comfortable. It doesn't give you any of the rewards that people would seek in this life. It only gives you the great reward of eternal life. But the fact that that is nice shouldn't in any way mean that it cannot be true. <laughs> you know, that would be a bit of a crazy thing, wouldn't it? Generally speaking, in our experience, if something makes sense, and if it works, and if it brings benefit, we start to think this just might actually be true. So, you know, I don't want to say to people believe in Christianity because it's comfortable or good for you. It isn't, and it won't always be comfortable. It isn't always good for you in this life, in the, in, by the measure of this world's idea of what is good. It is truly good in a much greater sense because it leads you on a pathway to being transformed into what only God can make us. Somebody who is becoming a little bit more like the Lord Jesus, that's a good thing, but it's not the world's idea of what is good. Um, So I don't want to say become a Christian because it's good. I would say become a Christian because it's true. And I believe it's true not just because it brings us comfort, but because there's excellent historical evidence for it, for the person of Jesus, for the resurrection of Jesus. There's the legacy of the church and the good that that has brought us. There's the coherence of it. I believe the Christian message makes sense of life. I've tried to say that a little bit last week and a wee bit this week, that it makes sense of life in a way that no other belief system does. I think every other belief system falls down at some point. It either thinks we're better than we really are or worse than we really are or whatever. It says suffering isn't real. I mean, get your head around that one. It's not real, so stop caring about it. Or it says suffering is always bad and nothing good can come out of it. But Christianity says suffering is real and suffering is bad, but God can bring something good out of it. Uh, that, that, in other words, it makes sense of our experience um, in a way that nothing else does. So I think it's true because the evidence is there of history and of the Bible. I think it's true because it's coherent and it makes sense. And I would say it's true because in my experience, 
I know God and I've experienced Him. And I think these three things together are quite powerful. Maybe any of them alone isn't enough. Brilliant. Yeah. Th that last point, Paul, uh, we're, we're having uh, some other similar evenings to this. So on the 10th and the 17th of October, Jim Crooks will be here. Uh, and the first week, uh, he's going to speak on, can I believe the Bible is error free? So you're based on what you're saying, your experience, yeah. your faith, your trust in the Bible. Uh, and then do my feelings determine who I am? And then into November, Dr. Stephen Critchlow is going to come and do presentations, uh, one on coping with anxiety and a further one on coping with depression. So we're going to have a night similar to this. So uh, keep those in the back of your head. Apologies for people. That there, there are other questions here. And apologies if we don't have time. But Paul, I'm sure you'll be around and happy Absolutely. to chat to people. Uh, but let me just, on behalf of the people here in the church family here in Scrabble, I want to just say thank you to you for the time you've given us the last couple of weeks, but the hours and hours that you'll have put in in preparation to these presentations. So thank you. Thank you. Brian. Thank you.